Florence Nightingale, Chapter 4, Looking Out Step by step, and all unconsciously, Florence Nightingale had been training her hand and eye to follow the dictates of her keen mind and loving heart. Now grown a young woman, she began to think seriously how she should apply this training. What should she do with her life? Should she go on like her friends in the quiet, pleasant ways of country life? The squire's daughter was busy enough, surely. Every hour of the day was full of useful, kindly work, of happy, healthy play. Should she be content with this? Her heart told her that she was not content. In her friendly visiting among the sick poor she had seen much misery and suffering, far more than she and all the other kindly ladies could attempt to relieve. She felt that something more was needed. She began to look around to see what was being done in the larger world. It was about this time that she met Elizabeth Fry, the noble and beautiful friend of the prisoner. Mrs. Fry was then an elderly woman, with all the glory of her saintly life shining about her. Florence Nightingale, an earnest and thoughtful girl of perhaps eighteen or twenty. It is pleasant to think of that meeting. I do not know what words passed between them, but I can almost see them together. The beautiful, stately woman in her Quaker dress, the slender girl with her quiet face and earnest eyes, can almost hear the young voice, questioning, eager and ardent, the elder answering, grave and sedate, words full of weight and wisdom, of sweetness and tenderness. This interview was one of the great moments of Florence Nightingale's early life. A little later than this, in 1843, she met another person whose words and counsel impressed her deeply. And of this meeting I can give you a clearer account, for that person was my own dear father, Dr. Samuel G. Howe. Some ten years before this, my father had decided to devote his life to helping people who needed help. He had established a school for the blind in Boston. He had brought Laura Bridgman, the blind, deaf-mute, out of her loneliness and taught her to read, write, and talk with her fingers, the first time this had ever been done with a person so afflicted. He had labored to help the prisoners and captives in the North and the slaves in the South. In short, he was what is called a philanthropist, that is, one who loves his fellow men and tries to help them. My father and mother were traveling in England soon after their marriage, and were invited by Mr. and Mrs. Nightingale to spend a few days at Embley Park. One morning Miss Nightingale, for so I must call her now that she is a woman, met my father in the garden and said to him, Dr. Howe, you have had much experience in the world of philanthropy, you are a medical man and a gentleman. Now, may I ask you to tell me, upon your word, whether it would be anything unsuitable or unbecoming to a young Englishwoman if she should devote herself to works of charity in hospitals and elsewhere, as the Catholic sisters do. My father replied, My dear Miss Florence, it would be unusual, and in England whatever is unusual is apt to be thought unsuitable. But I say to you, go forward. If you have a vocation for that way of life, act up to your aspiration, and you will find that there is never anything unbecoming or unladylike in doing your duty for the good of others. Choose your path. Go on with it, wherever it may lead you and God be with you.